Well, markets are booming while small businesses everywhere are crashing. So what's going on and what's the role of central banks in all of this? Do they serve Main Street or Wall Street? Here to answer those questions are Mervyn King, former governor, Bank of England. Raghuram Rajan, former governor, Reserve Bank of India. Larry Summers, former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, and Janet Yellen, former Chair, U.S. Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Our moderator for this discussion is Stephanie Flanders, head of Bloomberg Economics. Stephanie, all yours. Well, I want, I want to uh, crack right on with this because we have such an extraordinary panel today and not very much time to get into these important issues about the role of central banks, how they can change, how they can be part of uh, a better global economy coming out of this uh, crisis. Um, there's a model of central banking that spread around the world from the early 90s, independent central banks targeting inflation. Uh, we've held on to that. It's had a lot of advantages, but I think our panel, we want to talk about whether there's a, there's a better mandate, a different mandate that they need to have now. Let me start by putting a polling question uh, for everyone watching, and uh, we will get the answers to that later on. But the polling question uh, to set the tone for this whole session is, do central banks need a new mission? So your first one answer to that is no, they're doing a great job managing COVID-19 disruptions, or yes, they need to be more focused on inequality. Yes, they do need a new mission, they're out of ammunition, they need a new toolkit. And finally, maybe the easy choice, maybe. But independence from politicians is still essential. We're going to get into all that, uh, but I want to spend a few minutes very briefly thinking about how central banks have responded to the pandemic, what's gone right, and maybe what needs to change. Janet Yellen, what do you think? Well, I think central banks of the developed countries have done a very good job of responding to the crisis. Um, there could have been a financial market meltdown. There was an overwhelming rush to the safety of cash in March. It threatened massive asset fire sales, which could have caused credit to dry up in the economy. And the Fed and other central banks erected emergency liquidity and lending facilities that have really worked and kept credit uh, flowing in the economy. Um, for example, spreads on corporate uh, bonds hit, were just spiking. And after the Fed set up its secondary credit market facility, they really came way down. And there's been a, a great deal of issuance of debt. Monetary policy in all the major central banks also became far more accommodative, lower policy rates, expanded asset purchases, forward guidance. In the U.S., both long and short-term interest rates are near historic lows, and they work to boost interest-sensitive sectors. And even here, you can see stronger housing and auto sales. But monetary policy has its limits, and the effect of lower bound is a serious constraint. And the notion that the Fed can do all that is required at this point to support the economy um, is just wrong. And the Fed is really pleading for fiscal relief. I believe it's essential. I think the Fed has been less successful in lending to smaller businesses that creates an impression of unfairness that the Fed is on the side of big companies and on Wall Street. Um, this is something that's very difficult to accomplish. But, you know, as Chair Powell says, um, the Fed can't spend, it can't give grants, it can't direct aid to where uh, it's needed to unemployed workers. And fiscal policy has a very important role to play now as well. Lord King, I know you've been, you've uh, echoed uh, some of what Janet Yellen has said in, in repeatedly saying central banks can't do everything. Do you think they've, they've played the expectations game well in this, in responding to the crisis or have they set them too high? 
So I share much of what Janet has said, but I think to explain what's gone wrong, I don't think central banks have explained clearly why expanding the money supply is the right sort of response to a shutdown of the economy created by governments, different levels of governments, in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This isn't a conventional recession. And, and as Janet said, the most important thing for central banks to do now is to say that this is a, a difficulty, a challenge, which needs government response, not central bank response. And I don't think it's government response in the sense of general fiscal easing. I think it's a response that's required to support businesses until we get through this uh, COVID-19 episode, at which point we can then let the market economy decide which businesses will thrive and which will fail, which I don't think we can do at present. And I think that although the actions taken in March were clearly very important and central banks acted very promptly, it does beg the question that since markets have now calmed down, why that very significant liquidity injection hasn't been withdrawn. And I think what's needed is a proper narrative now to explain why these circumstances merit particular central bank responses. I think we have to get away from the idea that if anything goes wrong, then central banks have to step in and throw money at the problem. Raghuram Rajan, uh, if you want to respond to what, what Lord King has said, but I'm also wondering how emerging market central banks, you would say, have responded and, and m m matched that, that challenge that, that, that Mervyn has outlined. Well, uh, Janet talked about the advanced country central banks have done having done a fantastic job, and I think this did help many emerging markets, which were subject to the same kind of stress that you saw in the beginning of the crisis in March. And uh, the accommodative policies of the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, helped uh, alleviate some of that EM stress. Also, emerging markets have uh, adopted some of the tools. Uh, from the uh, Industrial Country Central Bank uh, toolkit uh, to help their governments uh, do the spending, which, as Mervyn said, is extremely important to ensure the real economy doesn't collapse, that you, you maintain the body economic uh, by helping small and medium enterprises and helping households. That requires spending, and central banks uh, in Indonesia, Poland, uh, across the emerging world have supported their governments. The key question now, of course, is how do you uh, um, sort of ensure that that bridge, which was built to the end of the virus, it actually extends that far? And there are fears in industrial countries it may be too short. And emerging markets didn't build a pretty strong bid, uh, bridge in the first place because they had very limited resources. And that means that there is far more stress which has built up within the system which has been hidden by moratoria, by payment uh, uh, sort of postponements, and that stress has to be dealt with. This is not a central bank problem. This is a problem of fixing the judicial system so that it can alleviate stress, fixing the uh, you know debt renegotiation system. And again, I, I'll end by saying, uh, so far it's been very good, but whenever you get into these kinds of policies, exit is often a great issue. How do we exit without tanking the system once again? And I, it's too early to start thinking about uh, about it, but it is a question which will face us down the line. Larry Summers, let's take it as well. If we take from the other three speakers, quite a lot has gone right in the major central bank's response. But what would you have done differently? Look, the big thing was preventing a financial collapse. The central banks acted definitively to do that. That's all that was ultimately historically important. The mistake is for them to vastly exaggerate their continuing relevance. They lack, starting at the zero bound where we are, the capacity to provide meaningful impetus to their economies in any way that is consistent with any concept of central bank functioning they do not have the capacity to meaningfully affect the degree of inequality. They do not have the capacity to vaccinate people. They do not have the capacity to fight uh, climate uh, change. And they need to acknowledge the limitations of their influence in a clear way so there can be no pretending 
about what they're going to do and that the authorities have the responsibilities they do. The central banks have also, in my view, not put adequate emphasis on the global dimensions of this problem. A striking feature of the contrast between this crisis and the last crisis is that the last crisis had a major response from the IMF, issuance of SDRs, big increases in lending from the World Bank that was driven by the global community. There has been no boldness at the global level comparable to the boldness at the national level, and that could get us in real trouble uh, down the road, as Raghu uh, points out. And frankly, the central bankers, because they want to curry domestic political favor in each country, have not had enough to say about that. Just to come back on that, uh, you talk about a lack of boldness. I mean, Larry Summers, you've proposed uh, as one of the things that could happen to support the global system, a big new issuance of IMF special drawing rights, SDRs. We have to ask you, have you persuaded uh, incoming uh, President uh, Joe well, Biden of speak, that yet? They'll speak for themselves. I'm optimistic that the, the U.S. will not be the kind of block on that proposal that it has been before. And of course, it's possible to do substantial things, issuances of $500 billion without uh, congressional approval. So I'm optimistic that we'll see progress uh, on that. But I think that unlike the central bankers of an earlier era, you have seen much less discussion in the central banking uh, community of the global imperative, uh, particularly the challenges necessary if emerging markets are to avoid a wave of financial crises going forward, the issues associated with uh, debt relief. And I think that's been unfortunate. And I have to say, I think it's been because the central banks have been excessively focused with their domestic politics, which leads them to talk about subjects like small business, like the environment, which are really not basically within their proper remit. Jenna Yellen, do you agree that, that maybe the Fed shouldn't be talking about needing to target uh, the difference between black and white unemployment rates, for example, as it did in this summer, and shouldn't be engaging on this broader agenda as climate change? So uh, the Fed has always operated under a dual mandate. It's inflation and maximum employment. And in this environment, of very low inflation, too low inflation. There's really no conflict whatever between these two goals. And the Fed is really focused on trying to create a very strong job market. And I think that they have made that clear. I'm not sure everyone in the public on Main Street understands that, but full employment is a goal that they ought to pursue. Um, I agree with Larry that the effect of lower bound is a big constraint. At this point, they're doing almost all they can do. They need fiscal policy to help. But um, when they talk about inequality and the disproportionate burdens on minority workers, um, what they can do is to try to pursue the strongest possible job market. Because when they're successful at that, as they were um, prior to the pandemic with unemployment at um, a 50-year low at 3.5%, um, that brings benefits particularly to less skilled and minority workers. When job markets are really tight, we saw wages rising most rapidly at the bottom of the wage distribution. Um, workers being pulled off to the off from the sidelines, coming back into the labor market, firms finding it incredibly difficult to hire, lowering qualifications, engaging in their own training to bring people up to speed, um, willing to hire people that with a weak labor market, their resumes would have ended, wouldn't have been looked at at all. And the, the Fed has recently revised its framework um, for conducting monetary policy and emphasized 
that full employment is a broad and inclusive goal, and they've changed their operating strategy to, uh, and because of the importance of the effect of lower bound, to pursue that with vigor. And I think that's appropriate, and I think it's the strongest um, contribution that central banks uh, can make to um, trying to deal with inequality. They don't have other tools. Janet, can I just see whether we're in agreement? I am 100% in agree with you, agreement with you on the absolute importance of maximizing employment in the current context when there's no real danger of getting inflation to an excessive uh, level. I am in 100% agreement with you that maximizing employment is the best social program of all and confers all sorts of benefits. But don't we think that central banks really need to be careful about holding out the idea that they are relevant to sectoral issues involving differentials between one sector and another or structural issues like environmental protection? Would you agree, for example, that any idea that the Fed should make special efforts to buy green bonds is a confusion? So um, I don't think I've never heard the Fed say that they're trying to target the unemployment rates or situations of any particular group. In a tight labor market, the gaps, I think, between, um, for example, the unemployment rates of minorities and whites tends to narrow. I, I don't think there's anything they can do on that front. Uh, beyond a generally strong labor market. So it would be a mistake, I think, to say we're targeting the unemployment rate of any particular group. And on sustainable um, goals, I, I think it does make sense for in supervision to be taking the risks from climate change, both climate-related risks and the risks of changes in prices um, and stranded assets as uh, countries adopt meaningful climate policy, to consider that as a risk to banking organizations and to do stress tests to look at that. But of course, we need public policy oriented toward making a big difference on climate change. And I agree with you, that is not something central banks can be asked to accomplish. I'd, I'd like to yeah, just to add, uh, you know, uh, something on what Larry said about inward looking. I mean, to some extent, what you see is the large countries, the large developed countries have become inward looking for obvious reasons because of the political forces within their countries. So there is really no global leadership uh, right now. Uh, hopefully it will emerge. But, but also, I think the point he made about central banks, that's an offshoot of the fact that there's tremendous pressure to look inwards uh, in these countries. The Federal Reserve uh, had these uh, swaps with a number of countries in the global financial crisis and got a lot of flack for looking outward at that point. So it did uh, start focusing a lot more inward. And so that does leave a vacuum at the global stage uh, on issues of global uh, you know, transmission of monetary policy, cross-border uh, capital flows, et cetera, but also the issues that Larry uh, mentioned about cross-border credit, which uh, at this point is heavily, heavily under stress. Mervyn King, we remember the title of this is about Main Street or Wall Street. Uh, given what, what Larry has said, do you think that central banks or the Bank of England or other central banks have done enough to show that they're supporting Main Street, not just Wall Street? Do you worry about the fact that they are perceived to be propping up asset prices as a main tool of policy at the moment? Well, I am concerned that uh, the fact that the narrative about why monetary easing has been so strong in these particular circumstances, that narrative hasn't been made clear. So it's not surprising that some people have gone away with the impression that the objective of central banks is to support asset prices. I don't think that is their objective, but I think one can see why some people might think it. I think Larry is absolutely right in saying that the danger with central banks today is that they often give the impression 
but they're sort of all-purpose, do-good institutions. If there's a problem in the world that exists, central banks have to step in and deal with it. And I think that's a terrible mistake. I think Janet is very compelling in arguing that the dual mandate for the Fed allows the Fed to pursue strategies that will maximise employment. And it's reasonable to argue and to explain why that strategy will have benefits for wider constituencies in the country, not just the aggregate, but individual groups will benefit too. But I do worry that the, 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 if you like, the new generation of central bankers have been very willing to step into areas that, as Larry said, are clearly for government, and that includes climate change. And I would have thought that one of the big lessons from this, this episode through which we are now passing is that if we are going to do stress tests on climate change, we certainly need to do stress tests on the next pandemic, whenever that may come. Are we prepared for that? There are many ways in which financial stability is threatened other than climate change. And I think that over the next few years, the big challenge that the world will be facing is dealing with a wave of debt restructurings in both the business and, in many cases, the sovereign sectors. So I think Larry's right to point to the need for a more global strategy for dealing with this. But one reason this is so difficult, I think, is that over the past 20 years or so, central banks, as well as governments around the industrialized world, bought into this agenda of unfettered globalization. And we see now a very real pushback to that on very understandable grounds that many people have not benefited from that. And I think, therefore, central banks are naturally cautious before stepping in. But when it comes to debt restructuring over the next few years, central banks need to be part of that global debate. They were when Larry and I were involved 15 years ago, uh, and I think they need to be again. Larry Summers, if, if the response to this great need, the popular need to, to show that the policy is more inclusive, that globalisation could be more inclusive, and to the long list of things that you said that central banks are impotent about, could be just to say central banks' main role now is just to make large-scale fiscal action affordable, just as they effectively have this year by keeping rates low, making it possible for governments to borrow. Should they just recognise that that is their main role at this point? I wouldn't put it that way. I would put it that their main role is to support stable, non-inflationary economic growth. And I think for the foreseeable future, that's likely to involve keeping interest rates at very low levels. I think the deep problem, the deep macroeconomic problem that the world has today is that savings are exceeding the natural level of private investment putting downwards pressure on interest rates to near zero real interest rate or below uh, levels and leading to sluggish growth and lack of inflation. And that is the world's fundamental problem. And it is not a problem that central banks can on their own resolve. It is a problem that central banks can acknowledge, as Janet certainly uh, has in her period in the period after she left office in very strong and clear ways as the evidence has become uh, clearer. But they need to point up this as a problem, recognize that it has important implications for fiscal policy, that it has important implications for the ways in which governments manage their debts, and that they are prepared uh, to uh, do their part doesn't necessarily mean explosions in debt, but it does mean careful thought about a range of fiscal and structural policies. But we do need to recognize that whereas from the period from the late 1970s until the early 2000s, the central macroeconomic problems were the temptation to inflate and the crowding out of private investment by budget deficits. Today, the central problem is absorbing all the savings in a healthy way so that we have strong economic growth and we don't have huge leverage and huge financial bubbles. And that is a fundamentally different macroeconomic problem that calls for fundamentally different macroeconomic strategies of which there may be a role for inflation targeting, but it is largely beside the point
in a world where the real problem is insufficient price inflation and excessive asset price inflation. And we need to adjust central bank's paradigm to take account of uh, those realities. Look, if I can say one more uh, thing, the world's financial leaders said after Dodd-Frank was passed, after the Financial Stability Forum uh, did all its things, that we now had a much healthier financial system that could continue to function without large-scale bailouts. Less than five years after that was definitively proclaimed, we've had the biggest set of actions directed at propping up the financial system in uh, global history. And while it's looking okay right now, as Raghu said, we're not sure that even what we've done is going to be enough to hold. That suggests the need for a great deal of fundamental rethinking. Let me just go, we're going to hold that thought. We need to get the polling answers, which I gather are, are, are pretty strong. So if we could just bring up what the response from the, from the audience to the, to the poll was. So, so that's pretty evenly split, actually. I think we gave people too many options. Uh, but uh, there's certainly quite a lot of recognition that central banks need to think about new things and new toolkits. If you want to, we're going to go to some questions now. Uh, but if you want to use the platform to submit some questions, um, I will be able to put them to this amazing panel. But, but Janet Yellen, what, what's your response to what, to what Larry was just saying? Well, I agree very much with Larry. I think he gave an excellent description of what the core problem is that the developed world faces, that there is a glut of saving and a shortage of investment. And that's why the effect of lower bound is such an important constraint. And it's what really means that we have to have fiscal policy, structural policy, and things other than just relying on central banks um, to uh, keep uh, healthy growth with low inflation. Um, I, I think central banks need to do what they can, but then not overstate um, what it's possible for them to do. Uh, the Fed has recently concluded a strategic policy review and made adjustments to um, its monetary policy strategy, um, adopting a system called flexible average inflation targeting. I think this is an appropriate change. It somewhat improves the scope for monetary policy to support the economy when short-term interest rates um, are often constrained by the effect of lower bound. I think it's helpful in preventing a cycle of falling inflation, feeding falling inflation expectations. But, well, I strongly believe central banks need to be independent and need to do everything they can. The changes they've made, they're not a game changer from the point of view of secular stagnation. And bottom line, I agree with Larry on what's, what's required. You talked a lot about the importance of fiscal policy at this moment. I have to ask you, would you like to be more closely involved in that uh, as a Treasury, a Treasury Secretary for the new administration? I don't have anything for you on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't think you'd be a good Treasury Secretary? Could I ask you that? I could probably ask the rest of the panel that. It's for other people to decide, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, Raghu Ram Rajan. Yeah, uh, she would be a great Treasury Secretary. But let, let me talk about uh, uh, another issue, which is uh, related to Larry's secular stagnation idea. I mean, in, in some sense, uh, the hope for the world was that uh, fast growing emerging markets and developing countries would provide that demand, which sorely seems uh, lacking at the aggregate level. One of the big concerns we should have 
this pandemic is how much scarring has gone on in those economies because they haven't had the ability to provide the kind of fiscal as well as credit support that industrial countries have. So my worry is, apart from the uh, North Asian economies, which seem to have come out quite well from this crisis, many countries in Latin America, Africa, South Asia are going to suffer some uh, diminishing in growth potential going forward. Coupled with some of the impediments to trade that we see, I think this is a cause for concern for the global economy and something that we should do very much, uh, work very hard over the next few years to try and reverse. Uh, and that's where uh, Larry's call for global uh, sort of leadership, I think, makes a huge, uh, is, is of huge importance. And where should that leadership come from if we don't think central banks should be claiming that they can solve all these problems alone? Well, right now, it seems that there is uh, likely to be change in Washington. Uh, historically, it's been the United States which has taken the leadership. In, uh, in 2008, 2009, it was, of course, Gordon Brown uh, who, uh, you know, uh, essentially corralled the G20 into doing uh, some of the important actions Larry talked about. But we need somebody to actually take leadership now and corral the countries to doing more, uh, giving direction to the IMF and the World Bank, uh, and as well as perhaps getting some central bank action into this if necessary. The world central bankers are part of the financial G20. They should be calling for urgent action in the communiques of uh, the financial uh, G20, which ultimately uh, should lead to uh, a, leader, a leader's uh, G20. The world needs the kind of G20 meeting that took place in London three months into President Obama's uh, term to set the terms for a strong uh, global response. This doesn't involve any significant burden on taxpayers in the United States or other industrial countries. SDRs, more aggressive financial engineering from the World Bank. The IMF has twice as much gold by value as it did uh, a decade ago uh, because of the appreciation in the price of gold. There's no reason why it can't be backed to help support doing more for the poorest countries. The private sector has not engaged in any serious way on uh, debt relief and restructuring uh, for um, emerging markets. We all talk about cooperating with China on the most important global issues. There needs to be cooperation with China on the whole set of issues around support uh, for uh, emerging markets. If central banks could explain not that they can do it, but that ultimately the financial stability of all the institutions they're responsible for, the financial stability of their economies, depends much more urgently on achieving successful global cooperation than it does on anything else. If they could make that case, they would be making a much greater contribution to the current global moment than they currently are. Mervyn King. Yeah, I think it's it's much more difficult than that. In 2010, the issue was to bring countries together and allow them to do what they all wanted to do individually anyway, which was to ease policy and to deal with a rather narrow problem in a way of collapse of the banking sector. The issue we have now is much broader than that. The problems of emerging market economies or low-income in economies are one thing where global cooperation can help. But dealing with the underlying strategic issues facing the global economy is something rather different. And the problem is not the mandate of central banks. It's not the toolkit of central banks. It's actually understanding the forces that are leading the economy to grow very slowly. And understanding what's going on is far more important, actually, at present than the mandate or the policy framework. That, I think, is what needs to change. And it isn't just expansionary fiscal policy because interest rates are close to zero. It is much, much wider than that to deal with this problem of excess saving in the world as a whole means lower saving rates in some countries, but higher saving rates in others. Mervyn, Sorry, I, Yellen, I what this, what are, Sorry. Go ahead. I, was just, I agree with Mervyn, but I think the world looks to the central banking community to explain 
the nature of the macroeconomic challenges before it, even if the central banks themselves lack the tools to deal with it. And if the central banking community can explain, as Janet uh, just did, as I tried to um, a little bit in talking about the absorption of saving problem, if that problem can be laid out clearly, that is the first step. It's not doesn't solve it to lay it out clearly, but it's a crucial step towards the whole range of measures. And you're absolutely right, Mervyn, that it involves a million different things that are necessary to resolve it. But first, we need to define that problem. And that's something central banks can surely do. I totally agree. And I think the distraction of moving to other policy issues is taking central banks away from what they should be doing, which is explaining this central global challenge. We could have this conversation all afternoon. I would, I would really enjoy it. It's been a fantastic conversation, but we must move to the next session now. So Lord Mervyn King, Raghuram Rajan, Janet Yellen and Larry Summers, thank you very much.